Hi and welcome back to another video of Medic Notes. This video is on supracondylar fracture. Supracondylar humeral fractures are a common pediatric elbow injury, but are almost never seen in adults. The peak age of incidence is 5 to 7 years. The most common mechanism of injury is falling on an outstretched hand. With the elbow in extension, due to the close proximity of surrounding neurovascular structures, injury is common and a careful thorough assessment is essential. This picture shows the bony landmarks of distal humerus, olecran and fossa, lateral and medial epicondyle, trochlea, capitulum, radial fossa, and coronoid fossa. Patients typically present following a recent fall or direct trauma, resulting in sudden onset severe pain, and reluctance to move the affected arm. On examination, there may be signs of gross deformity, swelling, limited range of elbow movement, and echemosis of the anterior cubital fossa, it is essential to carefully examine the median nerve, the anterior interosseous nerve, the radial nerve, and the ulnar nerve. Check the hand for features of vascular compromise, such as a cool temperature, pallor, delayed capillary refill time, or absent pulses. Urgent orthopedic review is required for all supracondylar fractures, especially those with neurovascular compromise are evidence of an open fracture. Distal humeral fractures and olecranon fractures are important fractures to exclude as management of these can vary significantly. Other differentials include soft tissue injury or subluxation of the radial head. The mainstay of investigation for suspected supracondylar fractures is via plain film radiographs. In both anteroposterior and lateral views of the elbow, subtle signs on plain film radiograph for a supracondylar fracture include posterior fat pad sign and displacement of the anterior humeral line. CT imaging may be useful for comminuted fractures or where intraarticular extension is suspected, which aids with surgical planning. This is a plain film radiograph of a supracondylar fracture in lateral view. The Garland classification system of supracondylar fractures is a system commonly used in clinical practice. Also aiding in management planning. Type 1, undisplaced. Type 2, displaced with an intact posterior cortex. Type 3, displaced in two or three planes. And type 4, displaced with complete periosteal disruption. Patients with supracondylar fractures with associated neurovascular compromise on presentation need immediate closed reduction. The reduction is then secured with K-wire fixation, which can be removed in clinic after three to four weeks. Conservative management can be trialed with type 1 fractures or minimally displaced type 2 fractures, which can be managed in an above elbow cast in 90 degrees flexion. Type 2, type 3, and type 4 supracondylar fractures will nearly always require a closed reduction and percutaneous K-wire fixation. Open fractures warrant open reduction with percutaneous pinning. Any cases which fail closed reduction will also require open intervention. Any ongoing vascular compromise, despite adequate reduction, may need discussion with vascular surgeons for potential vascular exploration. This picture shows K-wire fixation of a supracondylar fracture. Nerve palsies are common with supracondylar fractures. The anterior interosseous nerve is most commonly affected by the initial injury. However, ulnar nerve palsy is the most common post-operative complication. The ulnar nerve is at risk during insertion of the medial K-wire. Malunion is an important complication to assess for following a supracondylar fracture. In some cases, patients may even develop a cubitus varus deformity, often termed gunstock deformity. A Volkmann's contracture can occur following vascular compromise with a supracondylar fracture, ischemia and subsequent necrosis of the flexor muscles of the forearm, eventually begins to fibrose and form a contracture. This results in the wrist and hand to be held in permanent flexion as a claw-like deformity. That's all for this video. Thank you.